the main objective of this study is to model flow and heat transfer process for nanofluid to drive exact solutions and conduct simulation based analysis and to evaluate the influences of supplementary mechanisms such as magnetic field and thermal radiation and finally to analyze the role of nanoparticles in improving the thermal efficacy of conventional fluid. <clears throat> so uh, this is the framework of this presentation. First, I will define the uh, modeling of problem uh, in which I will define the governing equation and their associated initial and boundary condition. Then I will make the our system dimension list. And then by uh, we will solve this uh, system of PDs by using Laplace transform method and uh, then I will, sorry, by using Laplace transform method, I will convert my PD into OD. And after solving this uh, OD, I will uh, use the Laplace inversion to find the solution in the real domain. And finally, I will uh, discuss uh, graphs for velocity field and temperature field. So now the modeling of problem, this is the uh, geometry of my model in which we can uh, see, I consider the ferrofluid. Uh, and uh, where their uh, magnetic field and radiation term is acting along the uh, plate uh, that is at the one end is uh, moving with the uh, uh, some field velocity. So this is my main governing equation. The first one is the velocity equation. And second one is for the temperature equation, where we can see V is showing the velocity and theta star is showing temperature. Beta naught is for the magnetic strength. Beta one is for Brickman parameter and beta two is thermal expansion coefficient. Sigma is showing the electrical conductivity and G is here for gravitational acceleration. QR is the radiative heat flux and capital Q is heat injection or consumption term. So these are some thermophysical characteristics that are involved in our governing equation. Uh, first one is the density. Uh, second is viscosity, heat capacitance, thermal expansion, electrical conductance, and thermal conductance. Here I use the subsequent CF, MP, and WF that are denoting actually base fluid, nanoparticles, and ferrofluid respectively. So these are uh, in um, uh, associated initial and boundary conditions uh, for my model. Now this is uh, the modified heat equation. Uh, where in heat equation, we have the QR term, thermal radiation term that have the power four. So we first make it linearized by using the Taylor series. So after putting this term QR in the main heat equation, this is our final heat equation. <clears throat> now to make our system dimensionless, these are the some dimensionless quantities. The first one is the axial variable. The second one is for velocity. And the third one is for uh, time. And the last is for temperature. So by adding uh, the above dimensionless quantity, quantities in our system. So this is the new dimensionless system. So the first one uh, is for uh, velocity velocity equation and the second one is for a temperature also there is associated initial and boundary condition in dimensionless form is defined here so this table is showing the all values of uh, new parameters that is gray shift number parental number their magnetic radiation term also alpha naught to alpha five or the parameters depending on the phi so uh, this is the fractional derivative Caputo Fabrizio that I use here. So this is the basic definition of Caputo Fabrizio. Also, the Laplace transform is given in the second equation. So after applying the uh, uh, Caputo Fabrizio, uh, here I just apply the Caputo Fabrizio fractional derivative on the velocity equation and the heat equation. And now uh, these are the solutions. Uh, for temperature in the Laplace domain. Uh, so this is the solution for temperature in the Laplace domain. And this is the uh, velocity solution in the Laplace domain. 
so uh, after using the laplace inversion this is the final solution of our model this is the uh, velocity solution in real domain actually uh, uh, velocity and temperature solution in the real domain so now i will discuss some results uh, before going to the results these are the some thermophysical properties uh, for drawing the uh, graph. So here the thermal conductivity, density, heat capacitance, electric conductance, and thermal expansion for our So this is the uh, first graphical presentation. Temperature and velocity profile for different shapes of nanoparticle. We can see, we have considered uh, different shapes of nanoparticle that is brick, slender, platelet, and blade. And for two different uh, types of plates, for ramp plate and isothermal plate, we got the different results. And we can see uh, we have uh, the increment in the temperature and velocity profile for both ramp and isothermal plate. So these are the results uh, for temperature and velocity profile for variation of fractional parameter. As I use the Caputo Fabrizio fractional derivative, so as we increase their order uh, from 0.3 to 1, we can see there is some fluctuation in temperature profile and also there is increase uh, in the velocity profile. But we can see for isothermal uh, plate, we have decrease as we increase the uh, value of fractional order. So these are the temperature and velocity profile for a different volume proportion of nanoparticle. As we increase the uh, amount of nanoparticles in our uh, nanofluid, we can see there is a uh, increase in temperature profile, but we can see there is uh, some decrease in the pro uh, velocity profile. So this is the temperature and velocity profile for variation of radiation parameter. By increasing the radiation parameter in our nanofluid, we can see there's enhance in the temperature and velocity. Both profile, we can see there's enhance for ramped and isothermal plate. So this is our velocity profile for variation of magnetic parameter. By enhancing the parameter, uh, magnetic term, magnetic parameter, uh, we can see there is decrease in the uh, for both cases ramp plate and isothermal plate. Now this is the velocity profile for variation of Grashof number by increasing the Grashof number for both ramp plate and isothermal plate. There is increase in their velocities. So this is the basic, uh, uh, the final result for Nusser number for different shapes of nanoparticle. And we, uh, we can see as we increase the amount of nanoparticle uh, uh, to its highest amount, we can see the blare shape is showing a uh, best result for uh, Nusser number. So finally, uh, we conclude that nanofluid uh, velocity is decreasing function of magnetic parameter M and volume proportion phi. Uh, the blade shape ferrofluid nanoparticles produce maximum percentage enhancement in the heat transfer rate ferrofluid. Uh, increasing Grashof number leads to the acceleration, accelerating the flow. The dispersion of nanoparticle enhance the dominance of viscous effects. Temperature of nanofluid is an increasing function of radiation parameter. And finally, the velocity and temperature functions poses minimum value for the ramp plate case as equated, equated to the isothermal plate case. So these are the some references that I use to prepare this presentation. So thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, nice presentation, Asifa. Uh, thank any you. question? Okay, don't have any, uh, don't have question. Thank you, Asifa. Thank you, thank you everyone. Okay. Uh, the next presentation is uh, Mr. Sani Salesu. Are you ready? Uh, 
かに。はい。Are you ready? I cannot hear you. Hello, Sunny. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. If you're ready, you can start. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just trying to connect using my computer because right now I'm using on. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Wait a minute. No. Uh, I want to tell everyone today afternoon we have a presentation of Professor Cho. Don't forget to join. Hello, Sunny. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, you can start. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, I think <laughs> I had some issues with my yeah. head on, but now it's okay. Yeah, thank you.
Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be discussing variation and inequality problems beyond linear spaces. Uh, uh, my name is Kovensani Salisu, and uh, for the basis of variation and inequality, we are like finding an element U C such that uh, T U here uh, into W minus U bigger or equals to zero for all W and C. Yeah, people will be wondering what is this actually? Uh, one, one thing we should have in mind is that uh, this T is uh, nothing but uh, a map coming from some non-empty subset of a, a set say X, which is supposed to be linear space and then going into the dual space of X. Uh, we should know this, I made mention dual space here because I'm referring to the more general setting of linear space. It could be like Banach space and uh, where the dual may not necessarily be the set itself. So that's why I made mention. So in general, this is where T is usually coming from. And uh, you will see, uh, we also have it in this nature, for example, you can take for a particular case where X is Hilbert space. This is, for example, Hilbert space and the variation in the quality is nothing but trying to find a point U such that this uh, representation occur. Uh, we, we, we actually have a lot of applications of this variation in the quality. Some of the application remains in machine learning we also have in signal processing, image processing, a lot of application actually can be found in the literature. That is what makes it still an active area of research. Uh, so what is the key motivation? I'm not going to pay much attention to the application because I believe many students have discussed about variation and equality. And new people knows a lot of application that can be related to variation and equality. So my focus is gonna be uh, actually based on the mathematical background. So what I want to address now is uh, the motivation behind the mathematics of uh, uh, variation and equality. Now you consider a smooth function, say f, for example, from Rn to R, then if f is convex, on a particular set by convex on C here, I mean, when F is restricted to C, then it's convex. If and only if this happens, this is like characterization of convex for whatever domain you may consider. If C is Rn fine, that is to say F is convex completely. But if C is some subset of Rn, then it's like um, uh, when it is restricted to that particular C, then you can have the convexity. Uh, from this, this relationship, which is characterization of differentiable convex function, one can see that uh, actually a minimizer of F, which is uh, stated here, and then uh, the variation and inequality with respect to the gradient uh, of F are actually equivalent. So all you need is you can just use this inequality and you establish the equivalence relationship between this one and this one. So, but the main key, you know, uh, actually many problems, or let me say almost all problems arising from nature, arising from engineering and science are actually optimization problem. By optimization problem means they are subject to finding a minimizers, that, or for example, maximizers, or you can express it in terms of saddle point, but then, we have a significant, uh, or let me say, we have a very big problem here. Sometimes the function that arises naturally may not be smooth. And you see, you need to have it smooth and convex for you to establish this relationship. So if we don't have it as smooth, then we cannot talk about the gradient of F. And if we cannot talk about gradient of F, what happens? So you see, that is one of the important or advantage of studying variation inequality because we can only consider T, which need not have uh, 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 need not be a gradient of any function. But this is just a particular case when you reduce it to the gradient, you can have what you, you want. Uh, 
what is fixed point approach to solving variation inequality? Of course, we are in fixed point lab and everybody is familiar with uh, fixed point iterative algorithms. So I am not going to talk about uh, uh, the fixed point iterative algorithm from Picard, Ishikawa, Man, and so on. So I'm just raising my, uh, my talk with respect to variation inequality. So the most important of rate of our variation inequality is what we call metric projection, PC, from X on T, which actually retract a point of X on T into the set C. And that's the main focus of it. And an important characterization of such projection mapping is not but this inequality. This is very, very, very important because from this inequality, all the relationship of projection can be established. For example, uh, the fact that projection map is non responsive shown here, family non responsive as well can be shown here. There are a lot of things associated, the uniqueness of point or everything here with respect to, uh, to the point can be shown as well. So it turns out based on the definition that you, equals to projection of C uh, when it is composed with uh, I minus lambda T of U, then it will give exactly the solution of the variation inequality T U of this. So now solving this variation inequality is ex equivalent to actually finding this point of the operator of PC of I minus lambda T. So this is one relationship. So you can, decide to just go on and find the fixed point of this operator and it will help you to reduce the variation inequality. And whenever you solve the variation inequality, you can have fixed point of that operator back. So, uh, of course, in aspect of uh, this kind of uh, directional research, one may consider existence of solution. So now, from the fixed point perspective, we can, we already know that if, an operator is contraction mapping from his in complete matrix space into itself and always has a fixed point. And the advantage of it is just that, in fact, such fixed point is unique. And also one can get the fixed point by just using Picard operator or Picard iteration. And this is one important tool. So the scholars that are interested in existing solution the question normally they ask, what condition is required to guarantee the existence of such fixed point for this particular operator? Of course, you need to, to, to put condition for T, where T, when it is composed with this PC, the whole of this one will be a contraction uh, operator. Then if you have a contraction operator, it guarantee the existence of a fixed point. And this is it. This, this, this is one of it. So in the literature, one may see that sometimes when you have alpha strongly monotone, and uh, when Cs happen to be bounded, then you can, of course, get the existence and the uniqueness of the solution of variation and quality problem. So not just existence, another thing is approximation of said solution. For example, the solution may not, uh, you may assume that the solution is in the feasible set, you may assume that the solution is in the visible set, then what is required for you is you to approximate such a solution. So approximating the solution, we also have to seek for a condition or conditions that are required to, to, to be attached to this particular operator so as for us to uh, approximate solution. So now, for example, we have known how we, we know how we can uh, approximate a fixed point of a set operator non responsive mapping. So one may, may try to put some conditions on T to guarantee that the composition here will give non responsive mapping, for example, or passing non responsive or some, some other operators where necessary. So these are conditions that one will have to look at. So exactly. So what is the nature of it? Actually, what it says is if you have a set uh, space X, and you also have, uh, what do you call, um, this com uh, constraint set C, then all we are after is to find elements uh, U, upon which when you take the projection of U minus lambda T, U remains the same as the element. 
So this is like a graphical representation of uh, the solution element. So what is the structure of the algorithms? Or well, let me say most of the algorithms that can be found in the literature take the following forms, WN plus the PC. Why is this? You can see the first line is motivated from the fact that when this WN equals to UN, you always have the solution of the variation equality. So because of the initial statement that this coincides with the fixed point, so we have this, 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 this relationship. Ah, this is very interesting. Where the, the next iterate could be in form of some operator taking values of uh, UN and WN, interpolating them to, uh, to get the desired results. Sometimes you can just refer WN, uh, UN plus one to be exactly WN. And of course, it will work when certain conditions are imposed into the operator T. So this is the general structure of the algorithms that you can find in the literature concerning variation and quality problem. So, uh, and these algorithms is actually motivated based on the so-called gradient uh, uh, descent method. Of course, you can remember this. This is from the literature for finding the divisor of F. Of course, that's why initially we told you that it's as if as replacing the gradient of F by T. So this is the motivation starting from this one to the projected gradient. Now you need to project to C because we are dealing with constraint variation and equality problem. When C is opposed to whole sets or the whole space, then you don't need uh, to do the projection because that gives the unconstrained variation and inequality problem. And now let's take a look at a, a structure of a particular algorithm. For example, you have a space X and you have some constraints at C, this visible set. And the first thing you have to end somewhere along the C. Uh, for you one, it could be inside C. But when you project, whatever you project, uh, it has been established in the literature, the projection comes out to be at the boundary. So that's why here we represent it just as the boundary. Then you try to compute to n minus lambda t one to get it in this way. The next thing you now project this one to get w n just as stated here. And you also repeat the process using u n w n to actually compute what you call g u n plus one, which is somewhere around uh, uh, this guy. So this is like the general prototype of the algorithm you can find in the literature. Another way of it, for, for, of course, for the first one, uh, uh, classical iterative algorithm that can be found in the literature is that of extra gradient method due to Popolovich. Of course, it takes this form where you see this operator here is nothing but PC of uh, UN minus lambda and T. WM, and that's very interesting. So this is what we have. And for, for this one, some people now say, okay, the computation of projection, of course, is very expensive in general, because the constraint send may not be in such a way that the projection can have explicit form. So what needs to be done, they now make use of what they call half space. For example, this is a line here, this is the constraint C, then we have half space. And then the idea is, okay, when we take UN from on the half space, we try to compute this. And the next thing we compute WN, which connects the half space with the constraint set. And as well, you proceed to the procedure and you have uh, UN plus one. So this is another structure of the algorithm that can be found in the literature. Uh, so let's talk about the general direction and go back of uh, is a uh, kind of algorithms and variation and equality in general. So normally this is the operator we are dealing with. Ci minus lambda and t each n, for example, you can fix this one to have a lambda fix. You can assign some to find uh, values on lambda n, depending on what kind of problem you are dealing with. So now the very first concern is that for you to be able to project Mathematically, you must ensure that your C is close from that. So a natural question that may come from this is, 
do we always have flaws and conflicts arising from nature? Like what I mean from practical problems, do we have flaws and conflicts? That may not be the case in some cases. And another thing is this particular operator called uh, lambda n, which is the scaling parameter. Uh, we call it step size mostly. You know, this sometimes from the algorithm you can find in the literature it has to depend on the operator norm. And being dependent on operator norm means you have to do another optimization problem. You have to remember that computing projection itself is carrying out optimization problem. So for we to be able to compute projection at each iteration end, it's as if us we are doing another minimization at each end. And also, when, when we have lambda n here, depending on operator norm, because the operator norm has to do with supremum or infimum, is referred to whatever you take of a linear operator there, then, then in that case, you will also have to do, deal with uh, another optimization problem, which is very costly for the computer to carry out such tasks and even you. So another improvement you may find in the literature is, okay, of course, people try to get rid of the need for operator norm. And uh, some people try to consider the interval of feasibility. What I mean by interval feasibility, that is to say this uh, step size, where could it fall within, within what range you could possibly have it? Sometimes uh, people take it to be from one over L, where of course, even finding the Lipschitzian constant is also tricky, which involves some technical aspect of computation. And some people try to make use of self-adaptive in many aspects. For example, trying to take, get rid of uh, the Lipschitz constant or trying to get rid of uh, the use of normal operator and so on and so forth. Then another thing associated to T, of course, mostly in the literature, you will see that T is required to be Lipschitz. Uh, that's a very big assumption because uh, we may not have Lipschitz mapping in all the cases. And uh, another thing, uh, or the starting from strongly monotone assumptions, leading to monotone assumption from monotone pseudo monotone assumption from pseudo monotone to quasi monotone assumption. So you can see that there are certain assumptions that need to be imposed into the particular operator T for you to be able to achieve what you desire. Uh, then in general, the main concern is what could possibly be the projection onto C. We always have it. Of course, Sometimes it may have plus form and it may not have plus form. For the case of half cases as presented earlier, you see uh, you can be able to establish some plus form relationship while for other cases may not be the case. So that is a major concern. So you can see even though some, some authors have tried to mitigate many problems associated with this, but there are still challenges associated with it. And of course, this remains an active area of research. Oh, then what is this? Because uh, firstly, I would like to address that this aspect of uh, uh, variation and equality can be studied as well in uh, linear spaces. The first thing to consider, for example, now consider geodesic paths from U to W. By geodesic path here, we typically mean an isometric path in from an interval zero one x, where you can have gamma of zero equals this, this uh, one equilibrium, and this is satisfied. So first, of course, you need to have a metric space. When you have a metric space, then distance uh, you need to have two point u and w. When you take two point u and w, and you compute, you have an, a map. Let's say gamma, where this satisfies this assumption then that gamma is usually called geodesic path from U to W. Then we have what we call geodesic segment connecting U and W. It's nothing but the image of the gamma here as it is. And uh, that may not necessarily be straight line. It could be some curve, you know, just from endpoint U to endpoint W. And we, we, we have geodesic spaces. Geodesic spaces are nothing but actually space in which every two points are connected by a geodesic path. Of course, when 
every two point of that space is connected by unique geodesic pattern. We call that space unique geodesic spaces. Example of such spaces others include uh, linear spaces. For example, you can take uh, all norm spaces. Uh, they, are, they are all geodesic connected. And you can take three Hilbert spaces, which is very unique geodesic space here. You have Adam and Manipolis as well. You do geodesic space. We have Artre, we have Hilbert balls, we have Katke, we have. Please bear in mind that by three Hilbert space here, we actually mean a Hilbert space that is uh, not necessarily complete. Uh, that's to say inner product space. Yes. And uh, that comprises with Euclidean spaces and a lot of things that could be found there. Uh, let's quickly take a look at a particular case of manifold. This is just like a uh, visualization of it. Of course, in this aspect of manifold is smooth. One may even talk about notion of differentiability when the function is smooth. For example, this is uh, uh, the gradient of G at a particular point U. So we have this and you can try to project. There are many aspects of manifold that can be found, which I suggest uh, you go through uh, uh, some various material of research to find out. Uh, what is this variation in equality in matrix space? Actually, I'm just taking you to the basics of it because this is like kind of a uh, work that just started. So, 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 so you remember the linear space we normally represent it like this, but here in matrix space, we don't have inner product. And we don't even have action. We cannot talk about uh, dual space, most cases, because we don't know what it may be. So in this case, we try to say, oh, and this is related to this one, whenever we define T to be I minus T. Of course, you see T equals to I minus T, T can be I minus T as well. And this is very, very interesting relation. So when we found out this, then we still maintain that in metric space, we don't have minus or subtract uh, addition node. Do we have subtract or do we have inner product? So all these tools are not there. So what do we do? We try to say, oh, of course, when you look into this and use some identity in Hilbert space, you will see that this is nothing but uh, this relation. And when you have this relation exactly this, so using this, we try to define an operator for quasi linearization, taking four point to give the distance relation between the four point as follows here. Uh, I think there is. Visual typo, there are supposed to be some kind of closing parentheses here. Uh, then, using this operator, we have our variation and equality to be finding you in C such that P U G U W U yeah, is actually bigger or equals. Somebody may be wondering why the citrus of uh, computing all this. Ah, of course, such. Time spaces, for example, the geodesic spaces with uh, uh, unique uh, identification, such as cat zero spaces, have some important properties. We of course, uh, for example, the constraint set here, you see it, it can easily tackle constraint problem as unconstrained industry. One may consider manifold where, uh, stepped manifold where we have rotation metrics that is very, very, very useful in robotic motion control. Uh, we, we, then the, the algorithm pattern of course changes to this one. Why? Because already we changes P to I minus P. Therefore we can have now this relationship. Uh, then one may say, of course, still the remaining uh, same problems are still there. Yes, for the projection, we need flaws and complex. But here in these phases, the complexity here is much more than the linear complexity because this complexity has to do with the distance associated with the map. And it shows that many convex states uh, in linear spaces uh, uh, can be non complex here, and many also, many, many. Uh, uh, convex spaces here 
may not be convex in linear space. So this incorporated a lot of set, uh, uh, sets in it. And then the lambda n here, because the lambda n here, no need of operator now because you are dealing with this thing here. Uh, we don't talk about uh, the norm of operator. You have to try to choose a particular one within the interval zero one. You will meet up with the criteria you will get. And then that is to say the interval of possibility. But of course you can use self-adaptiveness due to the nature of the group that may arise. And the operator G also, can take all the forms of linear, but where you have liberty, strong monotone, monotone, pure monotone, passing monotone. Then, but the projection of C here is also doable. Very, very interesting. It could be done easily by, by, by closed form. Of course, in this space, we can also talk about upspace for special sets where the projection is possible. So this is the nature of it. But the most advantage of this space is the fact that constraint problem can be viewed as unconstrained problem. And then why do we express it in this form? It's tell you that of course, we don't have addition, we don't have uh, subtraction. So what the only thing we have is uh, the segment and how do we interact, how do we relate? So this is just telling you some element of the segment UN and G, UN. And that's very, very, very nice. And sometimes has a explicit form uh, in, uh, for, for the computation. So this is the prototype of the algorithms that may come up for, for this uh, kind of variation inequality problem. There are no, no much work on variation inequality problem in geodesic spaces. Actually, you can only have like a few articles on the line. Or you can have more articles when you restrict yourself to just a uh, Hadamard manifold. Of course, for Hadamard manifold, there are a lot of nice tools to use for because uh, the setting is very smooth and you can take that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for a nice presentation. Any question or suggestion? Uh, or suggestion? Uh, suggestion. Suggestion <laughs> to him. Any question? Okay. If no, any question? Thank you for a nice presentation, Sunny. Oh, thank Everyone, you. Everyone, please. Uh, open the camera. Open your camera and take picture together. Hmm. Happy Bala. Good night. Mm. Okay, one. Do you know? แคปหน้าจอยังไงนะพี่ขอมาพี่ขอจบ